the, 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 the Gramscian allusions in the, in the title, um, Now is the Time for Monsters, resonates with my own preoccupation, the sense of uh, living in a kind of interregnum, as Gramsci would have, would have said, a time when, when uh, an old set of futurities has become exhausted, um, but in which it is unclear what kind of alternative futures to define, to reach for, to imagine. My own directions in this set of preoccupations is to resist the demand, however, that we should um, redefine new kinds of utopias and to seek to redescribe rather the, 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 the kinds of futurities that were inscribed in our past. And I think that there is an important difference there. To redescribe, for example, the kinds of futurities that were inscribed in anti colonial projects, and to redescribe them in ways that are perhaps neither in, within the framework of the neoliberalism that defines our present, nor, on the other hand, in the autobiography of the nationalist projects themselves. But it is, to my mind, um, a project of redescription, a project of redescription. And to my mind, that is a, um, an enormously difficult kind of, an ongoing kind of enterprise. Uh, the document that I want to think about this evening um, is one to my mind that calls for a uh, redescription, re a redescription of its genealogy, a redescription of the very terms that constitute it. And it is a document known as UN Resolution 1514 of 14 December uh, 1960. Um, on the granting, on, uh, it was called the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples. UN Resolution 14, 1514. And it is to my mind, and why, why I want to think about it again, is that it is a, a threshold document in, in the story of the unfolding of decolonization. It is a document, it is the, a document in which the struggle for international equality in, the, in a global society arrived at a certain point of formal recognition in which the legitimacy of the anti-colonial demand for nation statehood could not not be recognized. Hmm? In that sense, it is um, a hinge document. And I believe that it is of importance to us in, a, in, in our own conjuncture when the languages of the third world, the, the languages of international legal and political equality in, in the globe uh, have become exhausted in one form or another, um, don't hold the kind of political weight that they once did. And in a, a conjuncture in which the, the hierarchies, the civilizationalist hierarchies, one might call them, through which um, up until the, the, the 1940s, 1950s, was the framework within which non-European peoples were, were, were understood, has returned in a particularly ferocious way clash of civilization kind of narrative which was described earlier. The challenge, it seems to me, which I won't meet this evening, uh, undoubtedly, is what, what the terms are of redescription. And, and, and I am um, uh, 
uh, healed by the, the distinction that, that uh, Lawrence began with, the distinction between a kind of complacent and restorative nostalgia and a self-critical one. What that, how that distinction is to be unpacked is a, is a fundamental challenge, which hopefully we will be able to discuss over the, the course of our, of our um, discussion in the next couple of days. So what was this document, Resolution 1514, and what were its constituent elements? We are going to see, I, I hope, that part of what is intriguing and fascinating about Resolution 1514 is precisely that its language no longer exists. And more than the, the fact of the exhausted character of its language is the exhausted character of the ethos that animated that language. And it is the, the, that, that the fracturing, the disappearance of, certain of, of political languages, the disappearance of the ethos that animated political languages, the hegemonic redescription of the globe in such a way that certain kinds of languages become unintelligible, that seem in effect to leave nowhere, that is part, to my mind, of the challenge of redescription. The language of, of Resolution 1514 belongs so squarely to another age. But before we look closely at Resolution uh, 1514, bits of it with are, are up on the, the screen, I want to describe for you a little bit um, the background of Resolution 1514. And it, it's not going to be much more than a, a, a uh, a, a gesture at part of a, um, a reminder of a history which is itself uh, buried by the dominant discourses of our present. The larger background to the emergence of Resolution 1514 of December 1960 um, consists, can, 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 be, can be narrated in terms of three uh, intersecting contexts. The first context is the galloping of the anti-colonial movement in the 1950s. Mm. The rapid upsurge of um, and, and pervasive and widespread global character of anti-colonial movements in the 1950s. It's hard, I think, in 2017 to remember that after several hundred years, the, colonial, col the modern colonial empires of Britain and France in particular were dismantled over the course of a few decades. They, they rapidly fell after the Second World War. And that, that movement, that intense movement toward decolonization is happening across the 1950s. In the British colonial context, of course, in terms of constitutional decolonization, in the French context, um, in terms of the war in Indochina and um, the war in Algeria. So that's the first context, the context of, of anti-colonial, um, of the anti-colonial movements and uh, of deconstitutional and armed decolonization. In other words, anti-colonialism was not an ignorable ideological and political force in the 1950s. The second feature, almost equally important it seems to me, and one that is too often forgotten, if not criminalized and demonized, is the transformation of Soviet policy toward decolonization movements and the newly independent states in the wake of Stalin's death in March 1953. This is a, a, a history which we easily uh, disfigure, if not straightforwardly collapse. That period from 1953 onwards is, is enormously crucial for the story of decolonization. You will remember, I think, that almost immediately after the, the pronouncement of the Truman Doctrine in 
1947, March 1947, I think, uh, the common form uh, was launched at the end of that year, September, I think, 1947. And they are mirror images of one another in a certain ideological respect. The Truman Doctrine ruled out or made a very strong uh, absolute contrast between states that were deemed to be to, to embrace liberty and states that were totalitarian. And the common form uh, pronounced a, a, a similar doctrine uh, about the irreconcilability of capitalist and, and communist states. But with the death of Stalin in 1953, there is a shift. And the shift begins, as some of you will know, to gather uh, definition with uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who is, who is very important for the story of decolonization. Uh, some of you may be surprised to hear. It is, uh, it is with Khrushchev that Soviet policy towards decolonize, decolonization movements and the newly independent states begins to shift. And the Khrushchev regime begins to develop a much more positive attitude to the doctrine of neutralism that was um, emerging in the, in the 1950s that is embodied in various ways in Bandung and transformed in the non-aligned movement from the early 1960s onwards. It I mean, the, the story of neutralism is, a, is, is, is itself a story that needs to be retold, the ways in which it emerges in, in, in different ways in, in India at the end of the 1940s and in France after the Second World War in, various, uh, in, in variously differently inflected um, uh, characterizations. But with the, with, the, with the rise of Khrushchev from 1954, 55 onwards, you have the beginnings of a positive so um, Soviet policy to, uh, with respect to economic aid and diplomatic recognition of anti-colonial movements and decolonization. And in, in some, some respects, as, as you will see in a moment, Resolution 1514 um, of, of 14 December 1960 is, it would, would not have been possible without this shift in, in Soviet policy toward the the emerging third world of the, 19, of the late, middle to late 1950s. So the first feature is, the, is decolonization movements. The second feature um, of this period that is crucial is the transformation of Soviet policy. And the third feature is the transformation of the United Nations, which itself is a story that calls out for, for um, cultural, political, and ideological um, redescription the transformation of the UN as an instrument of international decision making. Up until the middle of the 1950s, again, this may be a story that you know in more detail than I do, but up until the middle of the 1950s, remember, the United Nations is a, a body centrally organized around the General Assembly. We know the United Nations today as a body that is driven by, on the one hand, the executive office of the Secretary General, and on the other hand, by the ideological requirements of the Security Council. But in the 1950s, the General Assembly plays a much more fundamental role in the overall shaping of, um, of UN policy, and this is crucial. This is really crucial. Up until the middle of the 1950s, Western powers are not much concerned about this because they have a dominant voice in General Assembly discussions and General Assembly um, decision-making processes. Their main rival is clearly the Soviet Union and the allies of the, the European allies of the Soviet Union. After 1955, and with the step-by-step -step decolonization of an increasing number of, of colonial states. This, this uh, dominance in the General Assembly 
begins to slip away from Western powers. And the question of General Assembly um, comes to be one of, in, of, of increasing conflict, Cold War conflict in some sense, toward the end of the 1950s. And that is a, an enormously important context for, for what happens in December 19, 1960. So with that background, sketchily, hastily um, drawn here, anti-colonial movements, transformation of Soviet policy, the, the shifting ground in, in the character of the United Nations, I want to turn um, with, uh, equally sketchily, unfortunately, to the immediate context of Resolution 1514. It may not be um, entirely surprising, given what I have uh, just sketched, that the proposal for a declaration on the granting of independence to colonial uh, countries and peoples is first presented by Khrushchev when he's addressing um, the United Nations in, in September 1960. 23rd of September, in fact, 1960. And the proposal um, is that the, the, the declaration should be included in UN discussions in the General Assembly in, I think it's the 15th session um, that was going to be open in October, November uh, of that year, 1960. It's a very controversial period as, as, as many of you know um, in the UN, given the UN's very ambiguous role in what's going on in Congo. Patrice Lumumba is going to be assassinated in January 1961. So um, it is a, 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 a period in which there is heightened ideological awareness of the question of decolonization. Khrushchev proposes this declaration in September 1960, and at the same time presents it as a formal request addressed to the, the president of the General Assembly, a man you might remember by the name of Frederick Bolland, an Irishman, um, and a draft declaration, a substantive draft declaration is presented at the same time. There is very rapid agreement that the question of, of uh, uh, a resolution on colonialism ought to be discussed in the UN. But the question emerges, where in the UN should this be discussed? Where in the UN? I have five minutes, but I haven't gotten there. Where in the UN? Some of you may have heard of a man um, by the name of David Ormsby Gore. David Ormsby Gore was the British representative at the UN in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and he insists that the resolution be tabled to the political committee um, of the United Nations, which is a very, very powerful and ideologically um, Western uh, committee. And Gormsby Gore urges that this be the case because in his mind, the General Assembly is a purely propagandist or has become a purely propagandist platform. This is a, a fascinating and memorable moment. Some of you will remember um, in 1960, in September, in October 1960, in fact, when Khrushchev is supposed to have taken off his shoe and, and beaten the table the podium with it. I mean, it, that may be an apocryphal story, but this is, this is that moment when there is a, 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 um, a, a, an a ideological, serious ideological divisions in the, in the debates in the United Nations over the question of, um, of, of the resolution. I don't have much time. Um, Khrushchev wins the debate because he's able to call on the, the support of the, of the newly independent states. At the same time, however, at the same time, however, a second resolution is tabled. This one sub, uh, submitted by Cambodia. 
and it is uh, an important r resolution because Cambodia and the, it, the, the other sponsors of the, the second resolution are worried about the divisive character of the Soviet resolution. Um, it is the, 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 the Cambodian resolution that is eventually, that eventually carries on 14 December 1960. And the roll call when it is brought before the General Assembly is enormously interesting. There are 89 countries that vote for. There are no countries that vote against, but there are nine abstentions. And the nine abstentions were Belgium, France, Portugal, Spain, South Africa, the, U the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Dominican Republic. That's another story. That's uh, in many ways a Caribbean story, but that's another story. Um, Germany, as, 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 as you know, uh, didn't have a vote in the in, in the United Nations at the time, not until the early 1970s. The declaration I want to turn to very, very quickly, so you'll give me three minutes, four minutes, if you, if you don't mind. Because the, the language is marvelous, and um, you will see the, 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 the preamble there, mindful of the determination proclaimed by the peoples of the world in the charter of the United Nations. The, 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 the Declaration 1514 understands itself genealogically to be connected to, um, to the UN Charter as well as to the 1948 Declaration on Human Rights. To reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, but what does fundamental human rights mean to the, to the 1960 Declaration? Not merely individual rights, but the, the Declaration preamble speaks in terms of rights that promote social progress and better standards in a larger freedom, a larger freedom. What the meaning of that larger freedom is, is something that we can, we can talk about over a drink. Conscious of the need for the creation of conditions of stability and well-being and peaceful and friendly relations based on respect for the principles of equal rights and self-determination. Again, Self-determination is a principle that w was inscribed in the UN Charter and, in, and inscribed also in the Declaration of Human Rights. And as I will talk about uh, tomorrow it, 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 um, to some degree, th the principle of self-determination exists in these documents on the insistence of the Soviet Union over the resistance of Western powers uh, and colonial powers. Recognizing the passionate yearning for freedom in all dependent peoples, and this is part of the preamble that recognizes the, 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 the force of the anti-colonial movements at the end of the 1950s, um, early 1960s. The one declaration that I want to, to, to read is the third. I won't have time, unfortunately, to read um, all of them. The Declaration declares that, and it's the third one that I want to point to, because the third one speaks directly to the question of civilization. Up until the Second World War, the question of decolonization depended on a civilizational principle that one, ha one knows from the 19th century, the work of John Stuart Mill, all the way to David Ormsby Gore. The Declaration insists that that principle of civilization no longer counts. Inadequacy of political, economic, social, and educational preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying independence. Part of what has to be thought about and redescribed in um, thinking about Resolution 1514 is the, is, the, is the process by which the demand for self-determination on the part of, anti -colonial, of the, of the anti-colonial project, the demand for independence, became the peremptory right, as, as um, international legal scholars would say, became a peremptory right, became a right that could no longer be hedged around by um, the stage of civilization 
by education, by, by varieties of different um, constitutional, um, by different kinds of constitutional uh, arrangements. It had become an immediate, unqualified demand. It seems to me that this is a language and, that, and this is an ethos of the, the, the demand for international legal and political equality is a demand that we have in many ways lost sight of. It is not clear to me that this is a demand that we can simply reinscribe into the global political arena that we live in. Something about the, the language and character and direction and target of uh, the demand for or the, or the refusal of the question of preparedness for entry into international society is, is what the challenge is, so far as I can, I can see it. Thank you.